It's about increasing the asset side of the balance sheet. Why are we going into a global hash war? Because the, the countries, the sovereigns are now starting to understand that these liabilities, they work in good times, but they don't work in bad times. The United States and the West, they really should not get left behind in this global hash war because if they do, the BRICS nations who have more people and more assets are, are really just going to make our balance sheet more and more irrelevant. The opinions and suggestions expressed on the following program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily endorsed by program sponsors or any radio station, media company, or platform broadcasting this program. The following program is a product of Causeway LLC. Coming. Government officials insist we will continue to inform as this story unfolds. Welcome to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore, the Bitcoin-focused radio show that's waking the masses to the fiat money Ponzi scheme. Money is changing and your freedom is at stake. So stick around and learn how to empower yourself for this new digital age. Now, here's your host, Matthew J. Moore. And welcome America and welcome world. That's right, you tuned in at the right time, right place. I want to welcome all you Bitcoin newbies, lovers, and experts. This is one of the few, if not the only, syndicated Bitcoin-focused radio show that's on that traditional FM AM dial. And we have conversations that are going to tickle your fancy, enlighten you in this world that is evolving and is before us. Because you know what? Things are changing. They have changed. And to help me with that conversation is the other host with the most, Rick Jackson, a.k.a. RJ. RJ's in Oklahoma City. RJ, are you ready to uh, to rumble? I'm ready to rock and roll. We got to so some of my favorite parts of the topics, which are the technical ones. Don't worry, we're not going to get too technical, but it does touch on some of the foundational elements of this thing called Bitcoin, which is where I like to live. So yeah, I'm I'm ready to dig right in. Well, that's cool, man. I you know you know what's interesting is I I always scour the internet and the conferences and try to meet in interesting people. And I think our guest today is going to have an interesting viewpoint that he's going to share with us. Uh, we, I shared the stage with him, uh, interesting, interestingly enough, down in Miami uh, during the Bitcoin Energy Summit. So RJ, can you share with us, maybe tease us a little bit about who we've got uh, with us today for today's show? Yeah, today's guest is CJ Constantinos, the creator of the Bitcoin Fair Value Algorithm he hosts My Two Sats, which is a radio podcast, more of a podcast than radio show. And he's also the founder of the People's Reserve, which is a Bitcoin-backed bond company, which is something we'll let him touch on. But yeah, lot, lots of uh, lots of pies, lots of fingers, lots of plates spinning in the Bitcoin ecosystem. CJ, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. It's great to be here. I love it. Well, let's 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 dive into this. I I I want to. I mean, in in in. If we left something out, by all means, share, share. I want you to share with your own words is, you know, you're, you're creating content as well on the internet, like crazy as well. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, we got 54 minutes and I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about Bitcoin. Hey, that's fair. That's fair. You know, I appreciate the, uh, the, the, uh, look at that. Okay. So, Hey, let's, let's just jump right into the conversation. All right. I was watching a clip. I was watching a video and you were talking about this idea of global, hash rate wars. And there's a, you know, some people might call it a coming Bitcoin war war for lack of better terms. But uh, can you explain uh, this concept? Uh, give us the groundwork for this idea. You know, we need to talk, we need to unpack hash rate, what that means and, and what that means to the viewer, because some people might be listening to this and they might be, okay, hash rate. And what does that, ha what does that word mean? What does it relate to Bitcoin? And why does it lead to war? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you're new to Bitcoin, the best way to think about hash rate is just as a measurement. So when you, you know, everybody has used a USB drive or a flash drive or memory stick to maybe you have a presentation somewhere or you got to bring something somewhere to another computer. And the way we measure that is in megabits, gigabits and terabits, right? So uh, it's a, me a way to measure how much memory space you have on that flash drive. Well, hash rate is just a way to measure the amount of computational power that's going into the Bitcoin network. So we don't have to make it too difficult. And, and it's the easiest way to think about it is when the hash rate is higher, you have more computational power being contributed to the network. And when the hash rate is lower, you have less computational power being contributed to the network. And, and so and so, I think that's a, a great way to kind of introduce the idea. And so for people who 
if that makes sense, the idea that hash rate is more computational power or less computational power, can we, can you go into a little bit of the mechanics of Bitcoin in the sense of when someone's contributing computational power, what what are they computing? What are what are they working on or towards? Yeah, so the tool that miners use is called an application specific integrated circuit, and you might have heard of it called as ASIC miner. Uh, and what that means is that it's not a computer. So you know what's really going around today is you hear a lot about AI and you have these high, high compute uh, models. And those are actually computers that need to do multiple things in order to perform those computations. But when it comes to Bitcoin mining, that application specific is just mining Bitcoin, which is just taking guesses over and over and over again at, at a tune of trillions of guesses per second. And whoever makes the correct guess first wins the block reward. And that block reward uh, creates profit for the producer. So that's why they generate hash rate. They generate hash rate in order to profit. And that's where the fundamentals of Bitcoin really fall onto the natural laws of economics. Uh, and what's really amazing about the Bitcoin network is you hear some people say, well, what happens if they come up with, you know, some AI computer or some um, quantum computing machine? Would that break Bitcoin? Will that uh, cause a problem in Bitcoin? Uh, and the answer to that is, or at least my answer to that is, Bitcoin is already the quantum computing ledger. When you look at the amount of computing power that goes into Bitcoin, it exceeds that of Google uh, and every Amazon, every form of or presenter or hoster of computing power. If you add all of them together, it's just a drop in the bucket of water when compared to the amount of computing power that goes into Bitcoin. And a lot of that goes back to that ASIC creation where the computer itself is designed simply to mine Bitcoin and do nothing else. Whereas other compute, compute power has to do multiple tasks to perform uh, what it's what it wants to do. With a Bitcoin miner, it only hashes, it only takes guesses, it only contributes to the network and does nothing else. So that's a really important concept that uh, there's this sole focus uh, on what a Bitcoin miner can do. And it's not distracted by anything else. Yeah. So, so let me, let me see if I can, can uh, kind of wrap this all up. There's a bunch of people on the Bitcoin network. They're sending messages that contain transactions back and forth. A miner, someone who's in the pro in the, uh, in the business of aggregating all those transactions to produce the set of transactions for a given time, we call those blocks. And with that set of blocks, part of the way that the Bitcoin network verifies that these are legitimate is as you say they're they're taking they're taking guesses at what are effectively cryptographic solutions to the big puzzle that is bitcoin saying look i the miner have looked at past transactions i've looked at the state of the network and i'm verif i'm proving to you that i've verified everything that everybody's saying is true and to show you that i've done that work i am spending my actual money on electricity and on asics i won't call them computers from now on on asics to try to guess these things uh, that Add up to, add up to what CJ? So we're 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 trying to find something. You said we're taking a guess. What are we taking guesses at, and what is the answer that we're looking for? Yeah, so it's just a hash, and you're looking for the correct hash to match the block in order for your block template, the transactions that that specific miner includes in that block template, to add to the blockchain itself. Now, what's really interesting is that some of your listeners probably heard the idea of proof of work. And this is the work that's being done. This is the proof of work that's being done. It's not just about gathering those transactions in the mempool and adding them to the block. It's doing it in a way that is validated by the consensus mechanism, which is that proof of work algorithm. Now, what's really interesting is that the more and more people who try to do this, uh, there's something called the difficulty adjustment. And this ties into Bitcoin being engineered money. So a lot of people learn about Bitcoin and the first thing they learn is, well, there's only 21 million coins. It's absolute digital scarcity. Uh, and then they stop there. But the next step of learning about the engineered components of Bitcoin is the difficulty adjustment because the difficulty adjustment, its job is to do one thing. And that is to make sure that those miners who are blocking together those transactions to add to the blockchain itself are only able to add blocks every 10 minutes. So the difficulty adjustment targets a 10 minute block time. Now that's really important because as hash rate goes up and more computational power is contributed to the network, blocks can be found uh, 
at a faster than a 10 minute pace. And what happens is over the course of 2016 blocks, the difficulty will adjust, which is roughly two weeks. So roughly about every two weeks with 10 minute block times, we get a difficulty adjustment. And if the block times are lower than 10 minutes, the difficulty will um, increase, making it harder, increasing the cost of production uh, for miners to earn that Bitcoin block and vice versa. If blocks take longer, the difficulty will reduce, making it easier and lowering the cost of production to find those Bitcoin blocks. And all this ties into the economics, which we'll uh, get into later. But that proof of work concept with the 21 million absolute finite supply and digital guaranteed scarcity, plus the difficulty adjustment, those are the two magic makers that makes Bitcoin, what I say, uh, the first real form of money. We've used quite a bit of things to stand in as money, most notably gold, and it worked great. But Bitcoin works better because it's engineered. And I like to say, you know, if you could you could carve a bow out of a tree and you, you're going to have a pretty good bow. But if you engineer a bow and you create it in a factory, that bow is always going to be better and more powerful than a, one carved from a tree. So that's what we're looking at here. Gold is that old money that did its job and taught us what the characteristics of money really are. And then Bitcoin comes in with its engineered design, with its strategic design to empower savers, to empower we the people um, by leveraging the natural laws of economics to work for us rather than against us. So when we, I, you know, I've heard you say that about uh, Bitcoin, and I agree. Bitcoin came in; it's Im improved upon the the six or seven principles that uh, you know are there uh, that people would argue that make something a good money. And it's the essentially the apex predator. But uh, a lot of people are sitting here thinking in their heads; they're going, "Okay, Bitcoin is a better form of money, and it has something to do with this whole difficulty adjustment because it's the only commodity that has this difficulty adjustment." We're talking supply and demand economics. Uh, what does this mean for price? I mean, hash rate, difficulty adjustment. I mean, where where does this take us as far as dollar price? Is there is there uh, consequence, good consequences, I guess, uh, benefits? I should not consequences, but benefits to having all these elements together when it comes to living in this fiat based world. Yeah, absolutely. And and to me, this is where it gets most exciting. And I think before I dive into Bitcoin, what happens is as hash rate goes up, difficulty increases. When difficulty increases, the cost of production goes up. When the cost of production goes up, the fair value of Bitcoin goes up. So before I dive deeper into that concept, I want to tie it back to gold because I feel a lot of the listeners will be able to piece the puzzles together a little bit easier once they see how it works with gold. So if you're a gold producer... Uh, and the price of gold, the market price of gold is above the cost of production. And the cost of pro it's important to note the cost of production is the cost of bringing gold to the market. Right. So we're talking about land, labor, materials, all in cost of production. In fact, the gold industry, if you're part of the World Gold Council, they require reporting of an all in sustaining cost is what they call it. And I, I would like to see the Bitcoin industry also have that same metric and all in sustaining cost to help us understand where we are in the commodity cycle. And here's how it helps us. So in the gold market, when the market price of gold is above the cost, producers of the gold, miners of the gold are profitable. And every business in the world is, is created for profit, right? If you run a business and you're not profiting, close it down and go get a job. At least you'll make money. So the concept of profit is super important in free market and it, it is the driver of the invisible hand within the marketplace. And when the price of gold is above the cost, we have profit, the producers are producing it. And what happens is there's, like you stated earlier, Matt, there is no other commodity in the world whose supply cannot react to profitability, right? Because when the price of gold goes up and it creates more profit, more miners can produce supply. They can rip more gold out of the ground faster because they have more profit to reinvest in expanding supply. Well, Bitcoin miners cannot expand the supply of Bitcoin, but what can they expand? Their hash rate. So that's where this difficulty adjustment ties in this element. But before I dive into Bitcoin, one more thing about gold, because what happens if the price of gold goes below the cost of production and miners will stop producing the gold? And then what happens is the supply of gold will start to drop against the consistent demand, which creates a positive price pressure 
And eventually the price will go back up above cost of production as supply continues to drop. And when that profitability is there, producers will hop back into the marketplace in order to produce to gain profit. So this free market price signal, uh, it, this concept is of the utmost importance uh, for Bitcoin, because what we see is we see an algorithmic mechanism to help with sustainability and growth through the commodity cycle. The traditional system is dependent upon a small group of men uh, at central banks who decide the price of money based on politics, based on emotion, uh, and not they're not data dependent, even though they say they are. Bitcoin is mathematically and data dependent on the real numbers, the real profitability, the real cost of production. So that's that added element where we, the people who are savers, who want to store our value through time and space, we don't have to depend on a group of men. We can depend on a mathematical algorithm and a proof of work consensus mechanism that only cares about the numbers, doesn't care about the politics, doesn't care about the emotion. There is no emotion. And the power of that uh, can be seen in the performance of Bitcoin. So now that we understand how that works with uh, gold, let me tie it back into Bitcoin because Bitcoin is uh, it's just an amazing design. So the price of Bitcoin will be a the market price will be above the cost of production. Like we said, we can't expand the supply of Bitcoin, but we can expand the hash rate. Well, as the hash rate grows over those 2016 blocks, that pushes difficulty up. And when difficulty gets pushed up, the cost of production gets pushed up. Now, a lot of people in the industry like to focus on the peaks. You know, oh, we went to 1,200 and then we came back down. We went to 3,000, then we came back down. We went to 5,000, 10,000, then we came back down. Went to 20,000 and came back down. Went to 70,000 and came back down. But for people who have been in Bitcoin for a long time, sure, it's fun to talk about the peaks, but the definition of store of value is higher lows. And that's what this that's what this design does. The engineered component of Bitcoin with the finite supply and the difficulty adjustment, it creates value for us through time, through the commodity cycle. Because you can't escape the commodity cycle. A lot of people say Bitcoin is up and right forever. But in reality, it's up and down and up and down and up and down. But every time it comes back down, it comes back down to a higher level, much like gold. Right. Gold was uh, twenty dollars an ounce not that uh, long ago when we first started using it. Uh, and you could buy a really nice high end suit. Well, that twenty dollars today can barely buy you a T-shirt, but gold is upwards of twenty five hundred dollars. So you can still buy yourself a nice suit. How did that work? How did gold store that value? And the answer to that question is inflation drove that value. And this is what's so sad about where we are today and why we can't depend on man and all the politics and emotion, because we even change definitions. Most people today, and probably a lot of your listeners, when they hear the word inflation, they think, or they associate it with economic growth. But inflation is not economic growth. Inflation is simply the dilution of the currency unit that loses its purchasing power, forcing all prices to increase. And that includes the producer's cost of production. So over the years, as the dollars were inflated, in the gold market, what you see is the, the producer's cost of production went up. And when the producer's cost goes up, they have to push that cost to the consumer. Now, if they don't push that cost to the consumer, profitability declines. And if you look at the stock market today, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with the crazy price to earnings valuations and ratios that we see uh, on stocks. And the reason that we're seeing that is because the price of the stock is being forced up through the dilution of the dollar. The cost of production of that producer is being forced up. So the profitability is either staying the same or shrinking. But when you have real economic demand, when we talk about true supply demand dynamics, real economic demand will only slightly increase the cost of production, not equally push the cost of production up. And what happens is that increased demand increases the price, but the price increases relative to the cost of production, creating more profitability for the producer. And then the producer can take that profit and reinvest it to lower their marginal cost of production. I'd like to explain this in the water bottle example. If you create 10 million water bottles, uh, it might cost 10 cents per water bottle. But if you make 50 million water bottles, it might only cost six cents per water bottle. So see, when your cost is lowered, you can actually lower the front end price of the item, maintain the same profitability or more, but because the price is coming down, 
that naturally increases demand. So that's a healthy economy. We have more production and more consumption and lower prices that invite more demand. With inflation, we're getting the opposite of that. We're getting the same amount or even less production and consumption, the same or less profitability, and really just nominal numbers going up, not real profit. And nothing better demonstrates that than price to earnings ratios and, and pretty much everything you see in the marketplace. Well, Bitcoin doesn't have to worry about that because it was strategically designed to have an algorithm and a, and a consensus mechanism govern the rules of that commodity cycle. So interest rates aren't going to magically change. The difficulty adjustment isn't going to magically change. There is a, a solid, concrete set of rules that we know that are going to be followed. And this ties into the economic powerhouse that Bitcoin really can create in all economies because now businesses can make plans uh, in, the, in the long term. They can make plans based off of a set base of rules rather than a wild um, flip, like with interest rates. Everybody's saying a couple of weeks ago, there might not be rate cuts in September. But now you look at the CME FedWatch tool, and now it's, a, now it's an argument between, well, are they going to cut 25 points or are they going to cut 50 points? So there's no stability there. So the added element of stability in Bitcoin through this relationship between hash rate and difficulty and the proof of work consensus really is what delivers the fair value of Bitcoin to we the people who are trying to save our time and energy through space and time. Well, and that's what I want to uh, harp on there for a minute, um, because Bitcoin is that commodity that has the difficulty adjustment and this set of rules here. Um, people are realizing at a quick pace that uh, Bitcoin is essentially going to be the best place to store value, to store wealth over a long period of time. Is is this idea of this... Um, you know, supply and demand economics that you're, you're talking about and the difficulty adjustment, will this bring forth what people are calling a hash rate war, which I don't, you know, I don't really, I mean, I, I want the audience to know why that is, what does that mean? Um, why are people racing to, to acquire and build and have more hash rate? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer to that is profit. Because profit is the invisible hand that drives everything in the marketplace. And a lot of people get confused about how price discovery works. And I like to I like to compare it to like when you go into the grocery store. When you go into the grocery store, you don't make a bid on what you want. You don't go in there and start having a, an auction on different items. The producer sets the price because the price is set at the margin. So the producer is the one who incurs the cost. And... They have to cover that cost. And if they can't cover that cost, this is interesting. If they can't cover that cost, we see the free market price signal. The way that works is a person says, does this item deliver value to me at this price? So if you think like, oh, let me get uh, some M&M snacks. Okay, well, M&M snacks are $45. You say, well, wait a second here. Um, that the value I'm getting from this snack, a very quick, short snack, not a lot of energy, not a lot of nutrients, and I'm paying $45, the price is not relative to the value that I'm receiving. Therefore, I'm not going to pay that price. And what happens is as demand goes down, that price will fall all the way down to its cost of production. And if it falls below its cost of production, that is the free market price signal signaling to the producer, hey, you are wasting your time and energy and resources in producing this specific good or service because the free market is signaling to you that the value they receive is not worth the price. Therefore, reallocate your resources, create something, produce something that delivers more value that people are willing to pay a price above the cost because that is the free market price signal signaling to producers that, hey, you're on to something here. And that's what countries are starting to learn right now. The value proposition of Bitcoin is number one, a savings technology. But number two, 24 7, 365 access to liquidity. Uh, number three, easy, cheap, secure settlement anywhere in the world within 10 minutes. So these are really powerful value propositions to governments, states, cities, corporations, and even people. 
and the and that value therefore requires a price and the price is always going to be set at the margin and right now that that margin uh for cost of production for bitcoin and and my uh algorithm we have roughly speaking right around sixty thousand dollars so bitcoin is right around fair value right now and what investors need to understand is that the most important question you can ask about any investment you're going to make, not just Bitcoin, any investment you're going to make, is what I'm buying cheap or expensive? If you can answer that one question, you are going to be successful. Now, how do we answer that question? Well, it's always going to be market price relative to cost of production and relative to value delivered. So the Bitcoin value proposition we know that people need a way to save and outpace inflation. We know that corporations and governments need a way to settle billions of dollars in a quick, cheap, easy, and secure way. So that value proposition is going to stand the test of time. But what price do we pay to access that value? And that's where the cost of production comes in. So when the cost of production of a, of a value proposition that's going to stand the test of time goes below uh, the market price goes below the cost of production. That's what you call a discount. Now, a lot of your listeners will probably be able to re relate this to real estate. If you could buy a piece of real estate for less than it would cost to build that piece of real estate, let's say you have a single family home, 2000 square feet. And if you were going to source, if you had the means to source all of the materials and the labor and all, everything you needed, and it was going to cost you $250,000 to build that home, and you can turn around and sell it for $400,000, that's a pretty good deal. From the buyer side, however, you're paying 400 for what could be built for 250. That's a that's a pretty intense premium. So you have to be able to understand that that price is expensive relative to cost. You know what? Maybe I'll maybe I'll hold off here and wait until that price gets closer to the fair value. Or maybe you find a home that goes on foreclosure. Somebody made a bad decision. The bank needs to recover, uh, and now you can buy the single family home for 230 thousand. Well, you're getting it for a $20,000 discount to cost. That is a, a, a signal where you're saying, wow, I'm getting this asset for cheap relative to its cost. And that's when you want to buy assets. You want to buy assets when they're cheap relative to their cost. And you want to rebalance your portfolio when those assets are expensive relative to their cost. Having that one idea and mindset when investing uh, will be the difference between whether or not you have to hope to be successful or that you can actually produce results. So, so to 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 shift back from a an investor or a consumer side, you, you mentioned several times about the cost of production. When we're talking about hash and things. Can you can you tie the the concept of cost of production to to what is actually costing somebody? Like let's 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 use gold as an example. If I say a a gold miner has a cost of production, well, in my head that's pretty easy, right? You're renting or you're buying an excavator. I'm going out to land that I either own or that I lease. I'm digging into the ground. I'm paying people to to operate the machinery. If I have a you know a machine that filters out dirt from gold, like I have to buy that or I have to lease that. And so that to me in, in, intuitively makes sense. Someone goes out into the field that they think that they found, they know where gold is, they dig it out of the ground. And ultimately at the end of the day, they're all of that sums up to, as you describe it, cost of production in the Bitcoin world. I don't know that that's quite as intuitive. And so, so now linking in again, where we've talked about hash rate and, and things like that, and this concept of cost of production. Can you can you link those two together? Like what is it when we say the cost of production of Bitcoin? What what is actually money being spent on? What what is what is being invested in terms of a cost that ultimately we're trying to equate to a fair value? Absolutely. So land, labor, materials. Uh these are always going to be your three main things no matter what you're producing. Uh and in Bitcoin, number one, you need to secure the land. Uh so you can rent it or you can buy it. Uh, labor, you need skilled workers. Uh, you need people who can repair the machines. You need people who can operate uh, the, the mining operation itself. Uh, and, and then you need the materials. You need the actual ASICs that are going to do the hashing. You need all of the wiring. You need the racks. Uh, all of this comes together to form the all-in sustaining cost of a Bitcoin mining operation. And it changes throughout the world. That's That's one thing that's really hard there is no way to say like, hey, it costs this much to produce the Bitcoin. 
Well, no, because each and every mining operation is going to have a different set of costs. And we break those costs down into capital expenditures and operational expenditures. And I think one of the biggest problems in the marketplace today, actually, is that miners love to talk about their electrical cost of production, right? So they they have a solar mining farm uh, set up on 500 acres of land. Uh, and hey, it only costs them $4,000 of electricity costs to mine one Bitcoin. Uh, yes, that's great, but that's just one line item of your expenditures. <laughs> you also have to buy the land, the materials, the labor. So to set up that entire operation, uh, it might have cost a hundred million dollars in order to get to that point. So that's that's one of the reasons that I advocate for the the mining industry and and hopefully Michael Saylor and the Bitcoin Mining Council to start to require a reporting requirement for all in sustaining costs because. Uh, investors and the miners can be confused when they come out and say, oh, it cost me $4,000 uh, electrical cost to mine Bitcoin. And with Bitcoin today, at the price at $60,000, you would say, wow, this company is going to be really, really successful. Uh, but when you take into account capital expenditures and the cost of acquiring the land and the labor, uh, you could be upwards of sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. There are miners today who are mining Bitcoin at a loss. That's just the reality. Uh, and it's a cutthroat industry too. It's not always uh, rainbows and butterflies. Bitcoin's always profitable. No, uh, there have been very smart people who have failed in this industry. Um, my, I, had a, I had my own mining farm going into the 2016 halving, uh, and that's where I learned a lot of this stuff. I didn't really understand the effects of that. Uh, yeah, sure, okay, the block rewards cut in half. Who cares? Yeah, well, you're gonna care when you have costs that you have to pay. Uh, so I learned a lot of this uh, through my failures. Uh, and have been able to adapt. And that's what I think I really want the market to understand. This is a cutthroat industry and the cost to produce Bitcoin is much higher than the reported electrical costs that we're seeing popularly from the, the publicly traded miners. And that what that means is the fair value of Bitcoin is higher than what it is today. So the... So, the go ahead, finish the thought. The, the, the concept of... Bitcoin is backed by nothing is actually not true because it's backed by all of the costs that go into it because that's what creates that fair value. And today you can buy Bitcoin at fair value, but what the market is missing is that over time, as hash rate continues to increase, especially as we move into this global hash war, that's going to push up that cost of production like it has since the first block. And we're going to continue to get higher and higher lows of fair value, which is the most exciting thing for any commodity in the world. Because as we stated, this is the only commodity that has this engineered component. Yeah, so so that I think that was a, a great tee up and a, and a kind of a, uh, a question that kind of brews in my head is, okay, so I have a Bitcoin miner. They acquire land some way, they acquire materials some way, they acquire labor some way. And all of this eventually converts to, as we've described it, their ASICs producing hashes so that they can settle blocks and be rewarded in Bitcoin. And what you've effectively said is that my contributing uh, hash power to the network, my, my spending money on machines that will produce hashes, this hash rate increase drives additional cost because of the algorithm, drives a upward pressure or upward price cost. It increases my cost of work. So my participating increases the cost of production. So 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 kind of linking this in about the alluding to a a, a war, hash rate war, why would I why would I be fighting for or racing for additional hash or increased hash since adding more hash rate drives up my cost, which means I have to right it's it's almost as you say, it's very balanced, but you know, why why am I competing to make my life as a miner, more expensive, meaning I have to do more to do these things. So, so connect, connect those things. It seems almost counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of is. And, and what a miner needs to have is the long-term understanding that cost does not create value, right? So if someone spends a hundred dollars to dig a hole in their backyard, the hole's not worth a hundred bucks. You just wasted your time and energy. There's no value being delivered. It's actually value that creates cost, And this is kind of like the price discovery mechanism in, in free market economics. The more and more perceived value that Bitcoin can deliver, uh, the higher and higher that cost is gonna be pushed because what we're trying to do through this commodity cycle, through this price discovery cycle, is discover 
what that value is. That's the whole point of price discovery and the value proposition of Bitcoin in the long run, which is why these miners and countries are now getting into the game, is global GDP uh, divided by 21 million. And that's that's what we, has become the, the meme, infinity divided by 21 million, because global GDP is really based on human creativity and intuition. And as humans continue to create uh, and, and become more productive, then our GDP can increase limitlessly. So basically, you have human ingenuity and creativity uh, divided by 21 million coins. So that's the, the long-term value proposition of Bitcoin. And these companies are able to increase their hash rate to acquire more Bitcoin. And Bitcoin value proposition now is not well understood. And that's kind of what creates the, the big opportunity that we have in, in Bitcoin right now. Just like the early internet, people did not understand, even, even with pets.com and, and, and the big internet bubble that we saw, everybody knows that that bubble crashed. But after the dust settled from that, we got the Amazons and the Googles and everything that made life what it is today. We are in a new age of living. Look at all of us right now having this conversation over the airwaves all over the world. That wouldn't have been possible without the internet. So if people had understood that value proposition at that time, which some people did, and they made billions of dollars by understanding that, I, that's what I equate to Bitcoin right now. People stay too focused on the short-term price of Bitcoin and the commodity cycle we're going through. But as a miner, I continue to invest in hash rate and earn more Bitcoin because I know the long-term value proposition of Bitcoin is global GDP divided by 21 million. So if I am able to... Um, mine Bitcoin, earn Bitcoin through the block reward, sell a portion of that Bitcoin to cover my costs, and then keep the profit in my treasury. Over a long period of time, my company is going to become uh, worth quite a bit of money because Bitcoin has a compounding annual growth rate right now. Uh, I think the 10-year CAGR is uh, 60%. So you're talking about 60% growth over a 10-year period in your treasury. That's why they're uh, buying more hash rate, even though it's counterintuitive because, well, the more hash rate I buy, the less Bitcoin I'm going to get. Yeah, but there's only 21 million Bitcoin and there will come a day where nobody's going to be able to get any unless you're mining and you're and you're collecting the transaction fees. Yeah. So we this this idea of absolute digital scarcity, I think that's really what throws a wrench in the wheel for for traditional uh, analysts, well, because there is no other commodity that can't expand its supply. Well, and to, to your point, not only is the hurdle to get over this idea of having true digital scarcity, the idea of scarcity itself, I think, is very hardly conceptualized correctly. And to for our listeners and viewers who are, who are listening to this program, you know, and CJ, correct me if I'm wrong here, but, you know, to summarize it, to put it in a nice little box and bow, why this has so much value is not only has Bitcoin improved upon the properties of of money, but it's the only commodity that has this difficulty adjustment. And in some way, it is the purest form of a monetized, uh, monetized energy. And so uh, the, you, you talk about it being an energy commodity and this energy commodity essentially has no bleed. It, you know, it has not, you know, it's not, not escaping energy is not escaping necessarily, but it's, it's the truest form, the best form, the best, wrapper or tool or vehicle to represent energy in its purest form and the fact that it's scarce and we only have so many of those wrappers or vehicles to put that energy in am i going in the right direction here is this is this something that that yes, our baby yeah. oh, well not anybody baby boomers gen x gen z G, millennials whatever like they're looking for an easy way to conceptualize this vehicle called bitcoin yeah. So let's let's look at it through the lens of natural versus engineered. And when we talk about like uh, a candle, right? In the old days, they used to start a fire and, and light a candle. And a candle was like, oh, this is great technology. I can have that light for four or five hours, right? And then what happened? We engineered an unnatural solution to a, to a strong value proposition, which is light while it's dark. And you go from the candle to the light bulb. Well, okay, now let's talk about horses. 
horses were a fantastic way to get around. I mean, sometimes in some cases, and, and even in U.S. history, especially as we were after the Civil War, when we were connecting the East to the West and, and that expansion was taking place, horses were sometimes worth more than people. And that's kind of sad to say, but it's just the, the fact of the, the how the reality played out. And that horse, you know, even today in a car, what do we call it? Horsepower, right? We have an engineered, we have a natural way to travel with the horse, a natural way to move objects with the horse. But now we have an unnatural engineered component, a technological innovation. And that's what we're moving into the age of technology from candle to light bulb, from horse to car, from newspaper to computer articles, from just a, from a, a, a set of code that has a string of letters in it that presents text to you versus actually having a physical piece of paper that you can hold in your hand. Finally, paper money to absolute digital scarcity, finite money. It's all about moving from the natural, um, non-technological component to the unnatural technological advancement. And this is just one of the natural parts of, of money evolving. And that's why I say Bitcoin is the is actually the first form of money because all of those other things worked great. You know, horses were fantastic. They they helped uh, build this country. Um, but if they had trucks, they could have done it a lot faster, right? Um, same thing with money. The, our money happens to be one of the biggest hurdles in having a strong economy because we go through these boom and bust cycles. And these boom and bust cycles in large part are due to the human variable, the human element. And Bitcoin removes that human element. It removes politics, it removes emotion, and it, it replaces it with mathematics. And then the judgments are based on the mathematical reality versus the narrative. And that is the next technological innovation for money to move from that paper form where humans can uh, alter the facts and data set around that money to a digital form through a proof of work consensus that protects the mechanisms that guard uh, and rule over that form of money. Well, so there, um, I, I'm actually going to, I'm going to steel man something in it and push back because um, we've, you've said, you've said that hash rate increases and decreases while at the same time we've talked about how Bitcoin can remove some of the human elements to get us out of this cycle, uh, the, you know, the commodity cycle or the uh, the price cycles or, or whatever you name it. Understanding, of course, trending generally in one direction with higher lows and higher highs. Um, but if we're talking about a change in, in hash rate, a change in all this, like given what you've described about we're chasing ultimately all of GDP or all of value divided by 21 million, what, what information then can we glean from from decreases in total hash rate, because we've said if if the case if the case is ironclad that we're pursuing price discovery of all of you know all of value that we've labeled GDP divided by twenty one million, and there's a, a race to get as much hash as possible because I want to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible so that I have of course the greatest percentage of this you know div whatever the division ends up being. Why? Why then? Why then do we see drops in hash rate, or or a kind of a cyclical flow of of increases and decreases absent the the difficulty adjustment that you've described, which is very very like I'll, I'll call it kind of very micro changes because again we're 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 moving at a moving average, but these bigger commodity cycle boom and busts in in hash rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the human element with Bitcoin is not fully removed; it's just caged. So I think that's a, that's a great question because we're we're not fully removing ourselves from the equation, but we are limiting what we can do. So for example, when the hash rate declines and we get difficulty adjustment coming down, this is a sustainability mechanism because when the difficulty comes down, you know, hash rate decreases because miners are not profitable. And as that as that hash gets turned off and relocated or liquidated whatever it is, the difficulty decreases. So this becomes now a sustainability mechanism. But if you look at our traditional system, what do we need for sustainability? Well, look what happened during COVID. We had a lower interest rates immediately to zero, and then we had to perform quantitative easing. We had to monetize government spending, uh, and, and we had to take all of those actions for sustainability. So the decrease in the difficulty adjustment is partially caused by human mismanagement, 
you know, uh, a miner getting involved in the industry when the market price is trading at a premium to the cost of production and then using that premium price as a baseline and thinking that the price is going to stay at such a high premium to cost and then running that out in their in their numbers. And then when price comes back down to fair value or to cost of production, the whole model breaks down and yeah. and, their, and their business starts to lose money. But what's amazing is that we don't need the Fed to lower interest rates. We don't need to print more Bitcoin or print more dollars. The difficulty adjustment comes down, the cost of production comes down, and the miners who are managed properly are rewarded because they become more profitable. So it's a it's really a sustainability mechanism as well at on the downside and then on the upside, a price discovery mechanism. It's unbelievable. I, there's never ever been anything like it. So essentially it's minimizing malinvestment too. Um, yep. And uh, I, I, I want to, you know, we've got, let's see, oh, maybe 10 more minutes on the show here, but uh, I want to ask this question, which is, you know, we're talking about this idea of a hash rate war. Um, is this a bad thing for society? Is it a good thing? Um, are there things we need to worry about? Uh, you know, because people hear the word hash rate war and they think, oh, maybe this is a bad thing. Yeah, no, I, I this is a great thing for society at large because- what happens in the fiat system is that it's a system based on stealing. It's a it's a system based on governments being able to spend more money than they collect. Uh, and Bitcoin comes and says, well, you, you can't do that. You can only spend what you have because you can't create more Bitcoin. You can't increase the supply to spend it. Uh, and what that does is it forces the people who want to spend to deliver value to their fellow men or or if they're a government to deliver value to your citizens. You know, most people out there probably feel that the government here in the United States, at least, is too large uh, and there is too much spending going on. I think that's perfectly illustrated by our thirty five trillion dollars of debt, another two hundred and seventeen trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities over the next 50 years that we've promised to spend. Uh, and the only way that we can spend that money is if we continue to inflate the currency, which means we are reducing the quality of life and the standard of living for everybody else based on those promises. Bitcoin uh, delivers at first a harsh reality because you have to break those promises. But after those promises are broken, when the dust settles, what you get is a much more uh, beneficial culture and society that's based on delivering value to each other rather than extracting value. So at first it might seem that global hash words could, could be some kind of threat, but in reality, it's part of making the transition to a inflation-based, uh, debt-based system to a new equity-based system, where in the, in the inflation-based system, we have debt notes and debt derivatives system. We have equity that is proven by yesterday's proof of work by yesterday's cost of production already paid. And that changes the dynamic. They, they say that uh, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. Uh, and the way it does it is it changes your incentives. It changes the way you treat other people because in a Bitcoin ecosystem, you have to deliver value to get value. In an inflationary system, a few, a few uh, politicians can raise their hand and send you billions of dollars for making bad decisions and harming people. So, so let, let's let's click double click on that. You know, you've you've described basically a, a transition that kind of uh, moves us off an old world, uh, an, an old idea that is you know the, a, a fiat standard that you can effectively make any promise that you want, and if you need to, you just print money to be able to accomplish that at the cost or detriment to the detriment of quality of living. But but a two part question: one, why? What incentive does any politician have to to make that switch? Since you know, if, if I said I, I were the one, if I were to be the one who runs on, hey, let's let's make that transition. And to your point, yeah, we're going to have to break some promises that we made uh, moving forward. But after those promises are broken, it'll be better. You know, why would any politician want to be the one to say, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fulfill these unfunded liabilities. We're not going to, for example, we're not going to cover Social Security through kind of the rest of you know, U.S. society, we're not going to pay for, um, you know, whatever unfunded liability that we've we've promised people. So, in the one one respect, why would why would any politician want to want to do that? And then on the other side, if, if you're saying um, that that a 
acquiring more hash rate is what allows you to get a bigger piece of the 21 million the divisor the the uh, division of 21 million that that what would you know on the counterbalance to that not wanting to do it what would incentivize them to be one to promote uh the development of of hash rate capability in their jurisdiction or or that so so play play with those two balances and and kind of see if you can thread the needle on on kind of two competing incentives yeah i mean and that is a really astute observation and question and the answer to that is kind of what we're doing at people's reserve with our bitcoin bonds because what's going to happen is you're going to have human creativity and ingenuity start to provide solutions to these problems, right? So when you when you break these problems, that or, I'm sorry, when you break these promises, that creates a problem. So now the question be, well, what's the solution to this problem? Do we just have to deal with the consequences, or can can there be a, a way to get through this that actually benefits everybody? Like, yeah, the, it's bad that the promise was broken, but do we come out on the other side looking better? And Bitcoin bonds, I think, plays a big role. And I love that you brought up social security because uh, it's of my opinion, and I'm hoping to be able to at least talk with Trump or one of his team, mem team members about this, that what happens is um, the United States, Trump is really good at tariffs. Right, he's really good at um, collecting tariffs and and using that to empower the country. Well, our suggestion would be um, getting into this scenario where it's like, well, how do we keep these promises? What if we don't want to break these promises? How do we keep them? Beautiful. Collect tariffs in Bitcoin, and then as a federal government, you issue Bitcoin bonds, which are partial U.S. Treasuries and partial Bitcoin allocation. And when you do it, you are able to raise a significant amount of money, but you know the, who the buyer of the Bitcoin bond is going to be. It's not going to be people like you and me. It's going to be the Social Security Fund. Because right now, the Social Security Fund holds all U.S. government debt, notes, and bonds. And they're actually, they have a negative real carry because the rate of inflation is greater than the yield that they pay. So that's why we continue to see that the, the full retirement age needs to be increased Um the, the benefits in real terms, or in other words, in terms of purchasing power, continue to decline. In other words, the, the quality of life and standard of living provided for by Social Security continues to decline over time. And it's going to continue to do that unless we have some type of solution. Well, a Bitcoin bond, a, a, a country who can collect Bitcoin and earn Bitcoin through mining or through collecting tariffs or collecting taxes, will now be able to issue those Bitcoin bonds the, the program that they want to save can buy those Bitcoin bonds. And then what happens is, let's say the, the United States does a billion dollar Bitcoin bond issuance, which is pennies to them. But what they would do is 80% of that money would go into U.S. Treasuries at, say, uh, four four and a half percent And then over the course of five years, uh, that $800 million would turn back into a billion. So the Social Security Fund is not taking any risk because their principal is protected. At the end of the five years... They lent a billion at the end of the five years when the government debt matures, they have a billion. But what's left over is the 200 million that went into Bitcoin. And if that Bitcoin uh, compounds at a 60% CAGR, what you're going to do is you're going to recapitalize Social Security. You're going to sure. find that over time, Social Security benefits continue, can increase and you can actually come through on those promises. All right, CJ, I'm sorry, man. I don't mean to cut you off, but it's, uh, it's a hard break. Well, uh, guys, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you coming. We'll see you guys same time, same place. The information in this broadcast is not intended as investment, tax, or financial advice. Matthew Moore is not a licensed investment advisor and speaks solely from his experience and opinions. All information in this broadcast is for entertainment or educational purposes only. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and the company or platform broadcasting this program is not responsible for the success or failure of any person's investment decisions or purchases. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and the company or platform broadcasting this program makes no and expressly disclaims all representations, warranties, and guarantees with respect to this broadcast and its sponsors. Investing in any market is inherently risky and can be financially dangerous. Invest at your own risk.